Hi, welcome back. As some of you might know, I teach a corporate finance class. It's one of my favorite classes to teach. And if you ask me to describe it, I would describe it as big picture, applied, and essentially about covering all kinds of companies, universal. So I use real companies to illustrate the process, and I call them my lab experiments. So the companies range the spectrum. I use Disney to illustrate a large U.S. service company, and I use Vale, a Brazilian mining company. I use Baidu, a Chinese search engine, and I use Bookscape, a privately owned bookstore in New York City. I use Deutsche Bank, a financial service company, and I use Tata Motors. Now, people are puzzled when I use Tata Motors, even those people who might be from India are not familiar with the company. And the reason I use it is to illustrate the special challenges associated with managing and investing in a family group company. As some of you might, be, might know already, the Tata, Tata Motors is part of a family group called the Tata Group. And when I talk about the challenges of valuing a family group company, those who are familiar with the Tata Group bring up the point that of all of India's family groups, it is perhaps, it's viewed at least, as the most enlightened, the one where corporate governance should be of the least worry. And I caution them that even in a well-run family group company, there are conflicts of interest that are under the surface. I don't want to celebrate because it's not worth celebrating, but in the last few weeks, you've seen these conflicts play out. And I have a feeling that my next corporate finance class that's going to be in the, spring, in the coming spring is going to be interesting because these are questions we will have to address. So let me back up. The Tata Group is a sprawling family group. It, it cuts across many businesses. It's been around for 150 years. It was founded in 1868, and over time, it's, it's, it's expanded into multiple businesses. The way the group is structured is interesting. There are three family trusts. They're all run by the Tata family. The trusts are opaque. We have no idea what the power levers within the trusts are, but the trusts own 66% of an entity called Tata Sons. Now, 18.4% of Tata Sons is held by another group, Shapurji Palonji, which has long ties with the Tata family. They were a construction group based in Mumbai that over time has, has developed these ties. And the Tata Sons also owns 29% of Tata Industries. Now, Tata Sons then has minority holdings in 29 publicly traded companies. And I've listed some of them down here. And they range the spectrum. TCS, Tata Cons uh, Con uh, Consulting Services, the largest of these companies, but you're in steel and chemicals and tea and coffee and hotels and watches and you name it, ta the Tata's there. The Tata's also have uh, private businesses in their holding group, and these private businesses that exceed more than 80 are in a range of different businesses, and we know very little about these companies because their financials are not made public. Now, a couple of things about the public companies that are worth emphasizing before we dive into the turmoil at Tata. More than 70% of Tata company revenues now come from outside India. Tata, the Tata group might be an Indian group, but it's clearly a global player. There's a second fact. More than 70% of the market cap of the Tata public companies comes from one public company, which is TCS, Tata Consulting Services. That's a technology arm of the Tata group. Now, if you look across these companies and you wonder how the, the family keeps its control, Tata Sons by itself might not own 51% of each of these companies. In fact, it owns well below 51%. But because of these companies' history, they've accumulated cross holdings in each other. So if you look at Tata Motors, you're going to see holdings in, from Tata Steel and Tata Chemicals and Tata Motors. You're saying, so what? The family group can enforce its control, not just through its holdings in Tata Sons, but through the intra-group holdings. The second is, if you look at the boards of directors of these companies, you will notice they, there are independent directors that each company has, but they're also family group directors whose job, even though it's not stated, is to protect family group interests when the company makes its decisions. So it's a very complex, you know, incestuous holding structure where the family clearly keeps control over all of these companies. Now, for a long period, the 150 years of its existence, the Tata Group has been a remarkably stable group in terms of how it's been run, with very little, you know, very little evidence of cross, you know, intra-family fighting or anything that would bring it to the surface. So, if you look at its history over its 150 years, it, it's had only six chairmen. And if you look at the, the chairman of the board and you go all the way back to 1868, many of these chairmen have served 20, 30 years. In fact, the most legendary of these chairmen, at least from the outside, is J.R.D. Tata, who was uh, chairman of the, of, of the Tata's son, of the, of Tata Sons from 1939 to 91. 
So each successive chairman has built on the group, made it more, more expansive in its reach. And in 2012, when Ratan Tata, the last of the Tatas, you know, stepped down as chairman, Cyrus Mystery was brought in as chairman. Now you might say, well, finally an outsider running the company. Well, Cyrus was not exactly an outsider because if you remember, we talked about the Shapuji Palonji group, the 18.4% holding that goes back in history. Well, Cyrus Mystery is a, is, is, comes out of that group. He is the son of the, of, of the, of the founder or, or the grandson of the founders of, the, of that group. And he is related to the Tardis as well. So he's not really an outsider. He's an insider slash outsider. And he came in as chairman in 2000 with the full support of Ratan Tata. So if you know, if you looked at the history of, of, of the Tata group, you'd expect that he's, he's going to have a stint of 30, 40, or 50 years, given that he's a fairly young man. Well, in, on October 24th of 2016, you had a, you know, a fairly unexpected event for anybody who's watching family group companies. Ratan Tata stepped in, and you know, at least in the background, and the Tata Sons forced Cyrus Mystery to step down as chairman. Now, there's a little bit of a problem because as part of his role as chairman of uh, Tata Sons, he also was on the boards of directors of the other Tata companies within the holding group. And he was actually chairman for TCS, the biggest part of Tata. So those are, at least in theory, independent companies. So when he was fired from Tata Sons, he stayed on as director in the other companies, at least for the moment. Now, the reason that was given by the Board of Tata Sons for firing Cyrus Mystery was that he had not performed, he didn't deliver the improvements he promised at the time he became chairman. And as evidence, they pointed to the fact that dividends were down at the non-TCS companies. They separated TCS very specifically, saying, well, TCS is really a you know, standalone successful entity. You're not going to make much changes there. You were hired to change the rest of the company, and the dividends had declined in the, the non-TCS Tata companies, that earnings were down, that they were taking impairment cha charges from previous years. Now, so th they said that's because Cyrus Mystery had not done his job in turning these companies around. Well, Cyrus Mystery shot back, and then this was clearly a, a case where he was not going to go away into the dark by, you know, slink away. He fought back saying, well, that, that what he was doing was actually fixing mistakes made by the previous chairman, in this case, Ratan Tata, in terms of overreach, overreach in terms of acquisitions that should not have been made, investments that should not have been made. And he pointed out that there were only two parts of Tata Motors that really made money. And in this, there was surprising agreement. Both sides seemed to agree that the bulk of Tata's value comes from two holdings, TCS and Jaguar Land Rover, and that the rest of the Tata businesses are experiencing problems. So both sides seem to agree on it. What they seem to disagree on is about why these problems exist and what to do about them. Cyrus Mystery's claim is that these problems exist because of overreach by the prior regime, in this case run by Tata, Ratan Tata, and that he was trying to fix these problems, and that's why he had to impair those charges. You know, bad acquisitions lead to impairments, and that's what was leading to the lower dividends and the losses. The Ta Ratan Tata faction pushed back saying that that was, he knew that, Cyrus Mystery knew that when he was hired as chairman, that he was hired to fix those problems, that he hadn't done so the four years. Now the very opacity of the group and the difficulty of looking past the, the, the surface numbers makes it difficult for an outsider to decide who's at fault. But the very fact that there are factions is not a good sign. It's not a good sign for Ratan Tata. It's not a good sign for Cyrus Mystery. It's not a good sign for stockholders in these companies. It's not a good sign for employees in the companies. So I'll come back and talk about those, but I want to step back and look at what it is about family group companies that sometimes makes them successful and sometimes gets in the way. So let's start with, with, with some background. In much of Asia and Latin America, family group companies are the rule, not the exception. They dominate the economies. They've, in a sense, grown as these economies have grown. And in many of these family groups, the family still runs the company, either because they own big chunks of the company still, or because they've skewed the corporate governance structure with pyramid holdings, shares with different voting rights. The very fact that they're, they, they dominate these economies suggests that there was some point in time where they must have brought something to the table. Something about these family group companies allowed them to be successful. And something about these family group companies sometimes must get in the way because clearly some of these companies come apart. So I thought about the advantages of family group companies and I came up with what I call my four C's. So here are the four advantages that I think family group companies build on. 
The first is connections. What do I mean by connections? In many economies, relatively few people pull the strings. I mean, take an economy like India. So it's 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 a it's a country with more than a billion in population. You'd think that power is dispersed, but it's not. I mean, the way I like to describe it is India is a very small country when it comes to the big business decision making that everybody knows everybody else within the small clique. They went to the same colleges, they hang out at the same clubs, they often are related to each other. And family group companies for a long time have built on these connections. Why? Because the banker, the regulator, the rule maker, the, 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 the corporate CEO all kind of hang out together. So they use connections as a competitive advantage. And anybody who's ever tried to get a file through an Indian bureaucracy knows how critical it is who, to know who to call and what to say because that makes the file move faster. So connections are the first big advantage that family group companies build on. And those connections are going to be more important in sectors where there are lots of rules, lots of licenses, lots of regulations. The second is many of these family group companies predate the development of capital markets in these countries. In other words, stock markets and bond markets of relatively recent origin in many emerging market companies. And many family group companies predate them. You're saying, so what? Well, family group companies have internal capital markets, right? Because what I mean by that is if you have a company doing really well within a group, you know, it was the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, where you did not have capital markets, you could take the profits out of that successful company and invest it in another family group company that needed capital. Having an internal capital market can be an immensely big advantage, especially when external capital markets are not developed or you're in crisis. The third is control. Family group companies have absolute control, either because they own big chunks of shares or because they've kind of skewed the, the control of the, the game to make it in their favor. Now that absolute control means that they can make decisions without having to worry about people looking over their shoulders. You know, investors, analysts, and this can be a good thing especially if you feel there are decisions you have to make as a company that have long-term benefits but in the short term could make you look worse to investors. So presumably absolute control can be turned to your favor especially in some businesses. And finally, family group companies have a culture that cuts across the companies and over time. I mean, in any company, there's a culture, but the culture usually comes from a CEO. And when the CEO moves on, the culture changes. With a family group co com company, that culture can be deeply embedded, especially in many emerging markets where loyalty to family often was greater than loyalty to country or loyalty to community. And families were patriarchal and often shared the same culture. So connections, capital control, and culture, the four C's that make family group companies successful. And you can see why in the 90, in the, at least in the early part of the last century, through much of the last century, family group companies were the dominant business form in many emerging markets. You see what can go wrong? Those same four C's can be turned against you. Those connections, which turned out to be a competitive advantage, if that becomes your only competitive advantage, you get lazy as a company. You say, look, why should I build up other competitive advantages? So you could argue that family group companies that build only on connections are ripe for disruption from the outside. They're, in a, they're unable to compete with companies outside that country because they're coddled. And sometimes the connections can shift from social and family connections to political connections. And that's when connections become cronyism. And you could argue that family group companies, at least in some countries, are the worst manifestations of crony capitalism. They are successful because the government has put its finger on the scale and tilted it in the favor of the family. So connections can turn against you. Let's talk about capital. We talked about the good side of internal capital market, but there's a bad side. Without that discipline that comes from having a lender look at your books or equity markets ask you, why do you want to raise this money? You could argue that, that you have a potential problem, that you could have cross subsidies where you know, you make loans, intra-company loans are made at below market rates, or intra-company investments are in investments which you shouldn't be making. They're earning less than the cost of capital. So there is that problem of cross-subsidies. And you also have this other issue that comes out of these cap internal capital investments, which you have cross-holdings in companies. As somebody who, you know, you know, who looks at valuations of companies all the time, this to me is one of the most dangerous and difficult valuations to do, is when you have a company with lots of cross-holdings. So, Capital, the internal capital markets can blow back against you.
talked about absolute control. Absolute control can let you do good things, but it can also lock in the status quo. Where well, you do bad things and inertia drives your decision making and there's very little pressure I can put from the outside to get you to change the way you do things. So control can be bad control just as it can be good control. And finally, culture. We talked about how family culture is stronger and more embedded. Well, that family culture can be benign and, and a good family culture and it can be malignant. And if you have a malignant family culture and it's embedded, that can create a lot of damage because it's very difficult to uproot it out of a family group company. You can't just fire the CEO. And the implicit assumption that families share the same culture is increasingly dangerous to make because as you get, you know, the new families break up and they move in their own directions, I mean, it's, it's very likely that different parts of the family can have very different views on what the right culture for a company can be and that's I think those those create the seeds for the kind of intra company fights you see in some family group companies. So if you think about the pluses and minuses you can create a scenario the net effect is positive and the net effect is most likely to be positive in countries where you have lots of rules regulations and licenses and countries where capital markets are not developing. As these countries become more global and their capital markets develop, those family group companies can very quickly go from being at an advantage to being at a disadvantage. In fact, if you look at family group companies, they tend to be more successful in the old or more regulated sectors and least successful in the new economy. And that's something to factor in. So now let's get back to the Tata group. Clearly, this cannot continue because this is ripping apart the company, not just in terms of morale and what it does to within the company activity, but in terms of market cap. Collectively, Tata Group companies have lost 15 to 20 billion dollars in market cap since this fight began. So I I know they I'm sure they have plenty of advice, and you know, this is not going to be you know I'm I'm just going to throw my hat in the ring and give my few suggestions on what the company needs to do, and the company might not want to do any of these. The first is you got to settle soon. You can't let this continue. What does that mean? Whatever needs to be done to get this done, with, even if it means paying Cyrus Mystery to go away, I think it has to be done because the dispute can't continue. And I have a feeling that this dispute is, is as much personal as it is financial. At least that's what's coming out as I listen to the two sides, which also might mean that Ratan Tata cannot stay on as chairman of the group because that might be the reason why Cyrus Mystery stays in fight. So one of the requirements for this to be settled might be that both Mystery and Tata have to step away from the fray and find a third party that's mutually acceptable to step in at least as an interim chairman. In the long term though, here are the things I would suggest the group needs to do. If first, it needs to separate the public companies from the private. The potential for self-dealing and conflict of interest is great as when you have a private Tata company interacting with a Tata public company. So I think you need to separate the 29 public companies from the private companies. If that means creating a separate group for just the private companies, it needs to be done. Second, I think the public companies need to be made independent standalone companies that they are on paper right now but are not in practice. That will require that each of these companies sell its cross holdings and other Tata companies. Now, so that requires that Tata Motors get rid of its Tata Steel, Tata Chemical and whatever other Tata Power holdings that it has and go back to being just Tata Motors. And secondly, I think that the board of directors for each company has to have a single mission which is to protect shareholders in that company, not the family group. I'm not going to say eliminate intergroup activities because clearly some of them can be for the, to the benefit of the shareholders in a company, but I think intergroup activities have to be put to the same standards you would extra, extra group activities, which is if you're going to make a loan, it has to be at a fair market interest rate. If you're going to make an investment in another Tata company, it has to be because the return on capital on that investment exceeds the cost of capital. And finally, if you can do four and five, I think your financials will become more opaque and I think you can go further. I think each of these companies needs to work on transparency to make investors feel more comfortable about putting their trust in the family. Now, I think there are also lessons for India Inc. as a, as a country and I, you know, again, this, the, uh, I, I might be offering advice and might not be welcome, but I'm going to do it anyway. If I listen to many of the debates I hear within India, one of the things that people seem to, seem, seem to worry about is why India has fallen behind China over the last two decades in the race for global growth, why China has grown so much faster. 
I know there are lots of different reasons you can give, some good, some bad. But I think that one of the things India has to look at is how much family businesses have contributed to the growth and how much they might be getting in the way of India become, you know, growing faster. It This might be pure coincidence, but India has made the most progress in technology as a sector and the least in infrastructure and manufacturing. And this might be a coincidence again that technology is the sector in India where you see the most entrepreneurial zeal, the least family business. Now, you, TCS notwithstanding, and um, infrastructure and manufacturing is where family business is at the deepest roots. As India moves forward to being a more global player, opening up sectors like retail and financial services to global competition, I think. I, I don't think it should, it's the Indian government's role to step into a family group company and break it up. I don't think government should be doing that. But I think that the Indian government has to think about leveling out the playing field, making it less tilted towards family group companies. And I'd make three suggestions. The first is remember that connections help the most when you have lots of rules, lots of licenses, lots of regulations. So the less rules, the less licenses, the less regulations you need, the less connections matter. So I would start with that. The second is I think that if you look at investors in these companies, and many of these companies, it's either government-based or government-influenced investors who are the largest investors in, the in, the in these companies. For instance, Life Insurance Corporation, which is a government-run insurance Indian insurance company, is the largest stockholder in many Tata companies. For a long time, these government-based or government-influenced inf investors have tended to go along with the family. They've been more likely to vote with the family than against the family. I think they need to throw their weight around and be more, more activists, protecting the interests of shareholders. And finally, there is this cozy relationship between banks, which are many, many of them government-run or government influence and family group companies. And I think that that has, I mean, uh, sometimes it takes the form of lending to a company based on the implicit backing of the family group. I think those connections have to be broken and because I think that, again, I'm not saying that loans should not be given to family group companies, but they should be put to the same requirements that any other company would have to meet to take, get that loan. I think that in the long term, that will make family group companies healthier. It will make India Inc. healthier. Overall, though, I think we make a mistake sometimes by assuming that just because a family group has a great reputation that we can sit Sit, sit, you know, sit, sit on the sidelines and not worry about corporate governance. I think if nothing else, the Tata Group turmoil should remind us that even in the most reputable family groups, there is this potential for conflict of interest. I'm going to close with an anecdote. Now, but now I've been valuing Tata Motors off and on for the last six or seven years. I remember a few years ago, I valued Tata Motors and I came up with the value higher than the price. And... Um, and a, a person in the audience asked me whether I would put my money in Tata Motors, invest, buy shares in, in the company. And I said, I will never buy shares in a Tata company. And there was a, a you know, feeling of shock in the room. So how come? And I had to tell them the truth. I said, buying shares in a Tata company is like getting married. And the day after you get married, your entire set of in-laws move into the bedroom with you. Now, I get along great with my in-laws, but I don't want them all in my bedroom with me. You're saying, how does it? No, why is this even relevant to the Tata Motors discussion? Let's say I like Tata Motors as a company, that I love the way Jaguar Land Rover is evolving. I want to invest in Tata Motors, right? But when I buy shares in Tata Motors, here's what the Tata Group makes me do. It makes me buy shares in Tata Motors plus 30 other Tata companies through the cross-holding structure. That makes me extremely uncomfortable. So as an investor, I think that I would like to see these companies stand on their own two legs. As a manager, I, I'm sure it's much more difficult for a Tata company manager to make the right decisions because you constantly have to keep two masters happy, your company masters and your group masters. And sometimes you're going to be asked to pick, and that's not fair. So I think the sooner companies are treated as independent companies, the healthier they will be. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much for listening.